to just kind of get us into our bodies here, I want to invite folks to, um, you know, in seated, you can be seated, you could be standing, I'll be seated. Um, we're going to do a little bit of movement together. So just kind of finding a space in your body. If you'd like to close your eyes, you can do so, whatever works for you. So just starting to note your breath here. And allowing your body to move with your breath, whether that's your chest rising or your belly expanding. And you can see if you want to exaggerate that movement. So I'm feeling my breath in my chest and then my belly. I'm just going to exaggerate that a little bit, feel into that. So a few breaths of that. And you can release the exaggeration and come back to your normal breathing. And we're gonna start to do just some um, movement as your body asks you. So I'm starting with just some movement of my shoulders here, up and around. You're welcome to follow me or to follow your own body's requests. I'm switching sides, going forward and around with my shoulders. Let's bring up our hands if you're following me and shake them out. And with this shake, um, please join me if you haven't already. We're going to play a little bit with our speeds. So if you want to just choose one hand, that's fine. You can do both. Let's just call, you know, shake a normal pace. Well, I don't know if shaking is normal, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, just at a kind of easy pace for you. And let's call this a five. And then we're gonna experiment bringing this pace up. So let's go up to something like an eight. So we're going at, at a scale of one to 10. So maybe an eight is a little bit faster. And we can explore the 10 all the way up, just that total shake and bringing it back down. And I'll be talking about how we use these types of techniques um, in a little bit. And let's bring it from this five down to a two. So slowly moving your hand or hands. And you can release it, let it go. Maybe shake the other hand if you were just using one just to even it out. And we're gonna do something a little bit more open. So you can, use, you can use that shake if that's easy or just use the mobility of your arms or another body part, however you'd like to. But so we can start to move. I'm just going to do kind of circles with my hands here. And as you do whatever movement, now I want you to imagine that you are pushing against sand. So try to imagine that feeling. I'm imagining sand moving through my fingers as I push the air around. And you can drop that one and kind of go back to whatever movement you would like to be doing with your arms. I'm letting them flow. Now I'd like you to imagine that you're moving like kelp in a kelp forest. So I'm seeing the kelp leaves kind of move with the waves. I'm guessing if um, you're lower in the water, there might move, it might be slower. If you're imagining help at the top where there are lots of waves, it might be a little faster. And we can let that drop and come back to kind of a neutral movement. We'll do one more here. Um, so let's now imagine that we are popcorn kernels in a popcorn machine. So to me, I'm imagining kind of jumping up like a popcorn kernel might. And we can shake it out and come back. Thank you all for playing. This is a little bit of insight into the kinds of activities we would do. We would mostly do this standing and moving around the whole room. So it's quite different from our experience now, but nonetheless, a bit of a taste. I'll say too that a lot of the intention with these types of activities is to open up our sense of imagination and play and to connect with something outside of our current experience that might be occupying a lot of our minds. So, you know, we're working with folks who, many of whom struggle with chronic illness, for example, or chronic pain. Um, and we've got great feedback that sometimes this type of um, experience is just real medicine to connect with play and energized from a different perspective. Good morning, my name is Liz Stum and I am the Director of Community Partnerships and Program Evaluation for HIV Programs at the Shanti Project. 
and I'm also the program and research coordinator for SHARE. My colleagues, Selena Chan, Tammy Kremer, Christopher Gilbert, Eric Sutter, and I are so honored to be presenting on sharing humanity through arts, reflection, and expression for integrative health equity at IM4S 2022. So our objectives for today are to assess the practical considerations, benefits, and challenges of delivering creative arts for mind-body expression to underserved communities during COVID-19. We would also like to note that myself and my colleagues at SHARE have no relationships with financial or commercial interests to disclose. Sharing Humanity Through Arts, Reflection, and Expression, or what we call SHARE, is a partnership between UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health and the Shanti Project. And this program was designed to assist clients of the Shanti Project who were experiencing isolation before and during the COVID-19 shelter-in-place order. Staff and clinicians of the Osher Center offered to facilitate an online space which was designed to inspire connection to humanity, inner resources, and community. And this is done in a myriad of ways, but it's really focused on exploring mind-body expression, uh, narrative storytelling, visual arts, movement, music, writing, and more nonverbal forms of expression. Our clients, along with the facilitators, have built um, a really wonderful community uh, throughout our sessions. To tell you a little bit more about myself, um, what I bring to share is empathy, open communication, and I also offer familiarity to our clients. And to give you kind of a visual representation of my journey towards being involved in share, um, this first picture is um, my first Pride Parade, walking with the Shanti Project in 2016. Um, we walked with volunteers, clients, staff members, and this picture just represents the colorful, amazing community that I get to work with on a daily basis, um, who allow me to be myself, um, my authentic self, which I think is a pretty unique and special thing within the workplace. And the second picture um, to the left is me in Guatemala. This was the first time that I was traveling on my own, and it's where I developed my own personal yoga and meditation practices. And this next picture is me and my client. Um, we've been meeting for the last six years. I provide him emotional and practical support. Um, we, we meet regularly going on walks, coffee dates. Um, he is just one of the most resilient and positive people that I know. I learn so much from him and I'm just so grateful that he's in my life. So to start off, I will be giving you some more background about the Shanti Project and the clients we serve um, in order for you to get a better understanding as to why the SHARE program was created. So to tell you a little bit more about what Shanti does and who we serve, um, Shanti is a nonprofit, and our mission is to enhance the quality of life, health, and well being of people who are living with terminal, life threatening, or disabling illnesses or conditions. But really, at our core, Shanti is about building meaningful relationships. And these relationships we feel are essential for navigating life's most difficult challenges. We're able to do this through a continuum of holistic services, um, which include in-home and on-site patient and care navigation, emotional and practical support, which is provided by uh, staff and our peer support volunteers. And we also um, focus on preserving the human animal bond through our Pets Are Wonderful support program. So over the last year, Shanti served about 4,000 San Franciscans and over a thousand people um, volunteered providing emotional and practical support to our clients. Uh, Shanti has a really rich history of supporting the San Francisco community. So I'm gonna give you some highlights that demonstrate kind of our, our growth throughout the years. So Shanti was founded in 1974 by Dr. Charles Garfield. 
and Dr. Garfield worked at the UCSF Cancer Institute, and he trained the first Shanti peer support volunteers to be consistent and compassionate um, presence for um, people who were dying of cancer. And this was really one of the first times that volunteers were utilized in, in this way um, to provide support for the critically sick or people who were dying. Then in 1980, um, the UCSF Cancer Ward begins to fill with patients um, who would later be known to have AIDS-related opportunistic infections. And this is the moment when Dr. Garfield and Shanti decided to kind of switch focuses um, and provide support for people who were in those days were dying of this new disease. In November of 1981, um, we begin the first peer support groups for San Franciscans with AIDS, and we became one of the first community-based HIV AIDS organizations in the world. Jumping forward to 2001, um, with the help of federal funds, we were able to expand services and we launched our Lifelines Breast Cancer Program. In 2015, we merged with Pets Are Wonderful Support, PAWS, um, and PAWS is San Francisco's only program that's dedicated to keeping people who are homebound, disabled, very sick people together with their companion animals. And then also in 2015, we were able to expand our services to people um, who are diagnosed with any type of cancer who identified as women. And this is now known as our Margo Murphy's Women's Cancer Program. Um, the next year in 2016, we launched our LGBT plus aging and ability support network, uh, which we call Lawson. And Lawson provides support um, to reduce isolation among LGBTQ plus um, seniors and LGBTQ plus um, adults with disabilities. So the SHARE workshop is offered to clients of Shanti's HIV programs, um, the Margo Murphy's Women's Cancer Program, and our LGBTQ plus aging and ability support network. So in our HIV programs department, we serve people living with HIV and or HCV, um, about 300 clients per year. All of our clients are people living with very little income. 47% of our clients identify as people of color and 76% identify as LGBTQ+. In our Margot Murphy's Women's Cancer Program, we served 581 clients in the last year the majority of those people are living with low income and two thirds of clients are women of color. Um, also 50% of our clients in this program speak a primary language other than English. Then in our LGBTQ plus aging and ability support network, um, this is one of our newer programs. We serve about a hundred people a year. Clients are also living um, on very little income the vast majority of those um, in Lawson are living alone and over the age of 60, and 75% of Lawson clients live with a mental or physical disability. So Shanti is a Sanskrit word that means inner peace or tranquility, and we feel like it's a really appropriate name since ultimately all of Shanti's direct service and educational programs are aimed at easing the burdens and improving the well-being of people in difficult life situations. And our mission really wouldn't be successful without what's known as the Shanti model of peer support. And the model is both um, a philosophy and a set of techniques that are used throughout our work. And to break it down, the model is a way of just being with another person. Um, it really frees both parties to be fully who they are and to be able to communicate their feelings to one another. It also allows people to meet as equals, and it's a way of relating to others that is characterized by a certain set of values and attitudes. So we define peer a little bit differently than um, the traditional definition. Um, so we define peer as someone who is not necessarily like us in not necessarily like us in obvious ways, but someone with whom we share a basic humanity with. Someone who with who 
we are equals with. We feel that all people share universal human experiences and by virtue of this shared humanity, we are all peers. Um, so the model is really based on this equality. And, and the model is something that we you know, teach all of our staff and volunteers uh, before working with our clients. Some of the values that um, are in the model are mutual respect, positive regard, the empowerment of the client. Um, you know, we assume that the client has the solutions to his or her own problems, and they don't necessarily need your advice or direction. We believe that genuineness is incredibly important to really be yourself, be authentic. You know, our clients can tell if you're doing otherwise. Um, we, you know, teach acceptance of differences. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have to agree with everything that your client says, but um, we want you to be able to accept different beliefs based on, on respect. Empathy is a value, you know, allowing yourself to really feel with another person is incredibly important to making the model um, successful. Also, intention to be of service is big in that this kind of differentiates maybe your um, relationships with others, you know, in your life um, compared to a relationship that you have with a client. So some of the techniques and activities that we teach within the model are to Listen from the heart, you know, listening with an open heart, being willing to be touched by another, willing to engage with another person's emotions. We ask that you speak from the heart, um, really speaking authentically, being true to yourself with honest self-expression and acting from the heart in service to another person, acting based on compassion, um, caring and that intention to be of service really does make the difference. So the Shanti model is really what sets us apart from other organizations in the system of care and allows uh, Shanti staff and volunteers to build these really trusting, honest, and long-lasting relationships with our clients. So next, I just wanted to share um, our programs resource page, um, and this is on the Shanti website. So we update our, our workshop schedule with different resources, materials. We even have a collaborative playlist that like each you know, client contributed to. Um, so that's all up on the Shanti website at shanti.org backslash share. Encourage you to kind of check out these these different resources um, that are updated, um, some really good things on there. And then next, I wanted to share um, a quote from a Shanti client who participated in our workshop. Um, they said that a welcoming atmosphere that encourages different ways of expression and community building. Another client shared that when people share a vulnerable part of themselves, it opens trust for others to share, ultimately strengthening a sense of community. That's what I'm all about. And thank you so much. And next I'm going to pass it over to Selena Chan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Selena Chan and I serve as the PI and program director for SHARE. I also serve as a lead facilitator. And what I bring to SHARE is I love visual storytelling and metaphors. I like connecting resources and people. And in my job as an integrative psychiatrist, I also love learning what each person finds meaningful and why for their well being. At the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health, I serve as an associate director of clinical programs, and I'm on core faculty as an assistant professor. So this story starts with my father, an astronomy enthusiast, a Western trained pharmacist, and toxicologist who values physical, objective, and scientific evidence. And my mother, who always believed in not astronomy, but astrology, her trust for Eastern wisdom traditions to take care of my family's collective well-being. My parents named me Selena because in ancient Greek mythology, 
Celine pulled the moon across the night sky to illuminate landscapes. And I find it kind of serendipitous that my daily clinical work involves expanding to a holistic aerial viewpoint to identify constellations in the mind and body. This is a sculpture I made when I was eight years old, and I loved building all the pieces of the vegetables and then putting them together. And I think it informs my work. Every year we had a tradition, no matter where I was in the world, to come to Yosemite Park, find this tree at Olmsted Point in the High Sierras. And this tree is really meaningful because my dad used it as a yardstick. You can see I grow up, my dad gets older, I have new members of my family, and the tree also ages through time. As a second generation American born Chinese, different for what my dad will say, he is a Chinese born American. I grew up between Philadelphia and Singapore. And with that, I learned how positionality and culture influence healing. After college, I worked at an integrative medicine center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And here you see Dr. Ron Glick doing Tai Chi every morning and um, provided the wonderful opportunity for me to be a research associate there where I learned more about the body's inherent healing potential and I coordinated medical student rotations. This is in Arizona where I did my training and osteopathic medicine actually shares a lot of the core tenets that integrative medicine does. We get 200 to 300 hours of hands-on practice in osteopathic manual therapies. With that practice, we get a hands-on approach to learning about the bi-directional mind-body pathways that assist us with diagnosis and treatment. I really enjoyed being part of the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine elective rotation. My clinical training in conventional psychiatry was really foundational to learning how to address the root causes of illness with modern biomedical therapies, and psychotherapy. I trained in community healthcare settings and safety net hospitals, and that highlighted the importance of personalized, culturally relevant, high-yield, and accessible treatments. I wanted more hands-on training in the practice of integrative health, though, and so that's where I was just so thrilled to complete a two-year clinical fellowship in integrative medicine at the UCSF Osher Center. Every year we went to Yosemite Park, so coming back home to San Francisco, even though I had never lived in San Francisco, was um, very meaningful. All throughout my life, I've also been a planner, despite having to make different moves and needing to be very adaptable. And so I have thought that life works in this way, that you just go from start to finish. But I think during the pandemic, it really highlights how life actually works. And here's an example of a BBC newscaster who live streams from home. And there's a really special moment where we see another dimension of her whole person being with her daughter opening the door during the live broadcast. The stone, it's called Labradite. It's an iridescent stone that in different lights, it shows different colors. And I think people are like that as well. With this photograph, we just spent a moment together after the photograph and we have this shared love of expressive arts. We feel some percolating ideas and we go to the all Osher breakfast that happens in February, 2020. And that's our last in-person time together as an Osher Center community. We learn about this Mount Zion Health Fund Award and we think, oh, maybe there's a way that we can connect with that. March, 2020 happens and we go into shelter in place. Our clinic switches to telehealth for the modalities that can visit patients through telehealth. And I begin a weekly drop-in group where anyone from our clinic can come in and just check in on each other, make sure that we're taking care of each other. Chris and Tammy become regular participants of that. And we learn that we love connecting through metaphors. Ironic about all this is that Chris shared a office wall with me, and for many years, we just never knew this aspect of each other. So just dedicating this one hour space together helped us learn more about our whole person, which helped us learn, oh, we have some kind of connection in this area. 
So here you see a mini picture of Maria Chow, and she was no way mini at all because she helped us connect to the Shanti project by identifying our core interests and realizing it could be a really good match with the Shanti project. So we applied for the Mount Zion Community Campus Partnership Award, and we're thrilled to get it in uh, the fall, winter of 2020. And we met Eric Sutter, who didn't know what he was signing up for when we met with all the program directors at the Shanti Project when we were first conceptualizing this award and grant proposal. We needed to first learn more about the Shanti culture and traditions, because how can we enter into a new place, kind of like an anthropologist, without first getting a sense of the community and also going through the training that's required for even all the volunteers. So we went through that and also had various meetings with all the Shanti program directors. Hi, I'm Eric Sutter, Shanti Senior Director of Programs. The attributes I bring to share are openness, flexibility, and cross-cultural translation. This first picture shows me sticking my tongue out while hanging out with my brother and cousins about 30 years ago. I was adopted by a Chinese family just after birth, and my upbringing was somewhat unconventional. This taught me that family is really about relationship quality, and that one's chosen family can be just as, if not more supportive than their biological one. I'm mindful of this lesson in both my professional and personal life, and it informs my work with coworkers, clients, and collaboration partners. This next picture is of a mural someone put up about a block from my office in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. I've worked in the Tenderloin for nearly 20 years, and it's an incredibly complicated and totally unique place that I still struggle to fully wrap my head around. That being said, I'm continually struck by the creativity, generosity, wisdom, and resilience of its residents, the beauty found in its streets, and the surreal qualities day-to-day -day life there can take on. I'm proud to have worked there as long as I have and have no intention of leaving. This last picture is of my longtime client, Reggie Williams, and really captures his essence. When I was new to providing direct service, he hazed me pretty hard for about a year. And once he realized I wasn't going anywhere, he opened up to me and taught me so much about how to be the most effective service provider possible. He reminds me of the necessity of collaboration between provider and patient and all the expertise that people we have have to share with us. I feel like there's nothing new to be said about the difficulty so many of us face in having to adapt our service models to COVID. In San Francisco, on March 26, 2020, Mayor London Breed announced the shelter-in-place order effective the following day. Santi's work was identified as essential, with direct services staff coming exempt from the order while carrying on their day-to-day -day duties. The regulations around social distancing forced the cancellation of groups and drop-in spaces and required most people to primarily work from home due to our typically tightly packed offices. Staff remain committed to serving clients in person, with the provision of emotional support specifically noted as key to ensuring we were adequately meeting already isolated clients' needs. As 2020 dragged on, both staff and clients began to adjust to the new normal. We spend an inordinate amount of time trying to come up with ways to simulate the spontaneous conversations and connections that naturally occur when folks are in close proximity to each other. We try to find ways to foster connections between clients whose various afflictions made them more vulnerable to COVID and thus less likely to feel safe out in the world. A piece of the solution to both these problems came in the late summer of 2020 when I was asked to attend a meeting with some folks from UCSF who were interested in a potential collaboration with Shanti to bring opportunities for creative expression to our clients. I knew very little of, about the Ocho Center's work going in, but I came out of that meeting as the organizational lead in the collaboration. As I began working with Selena, Tammy, and Chris on our grant proposal, I realized a few things. Their collective experience was incredibly relevant to our approach to client care and staff support, we had a lot to learn from each other, and this is going to be a lot more work than I initially estimated. As the proposal took shape, we developed a plan to engage 40 to 50 Shanti staff and clients in workshops designed to improve their quality of life by reducing isolation, fostering connection, and learning tools to help cope with stress. In late 2020, we found out our proposal was funded by the Mount Zion Health Fund and promptly got to work designing our first series of workshops for staff. 
we started leading wellness retreats to first take care of the staff at the Shanti Project who had been taking care of everyone, all the clients and the organization during the pandemic. These launched in the spring of 2021 with the stated goals of building community across previously siloed programs, giving staff an opportunity to personally experience SHARE so they could better promote it to their clients, expanding on staff's self-care practices, identifying current client needs, and shaping the development and continual adaptation of the program. The staff workshop series took off immediately, drawing participants from all over the organization and providing a much needed opportunity for staff connection and learning. It was really the right thing at the right time. The sessions were so successful that the group of participants kept meeting after the workshop was over and supporting the product became more work than I could handle. That's my friend and colleague, Lee, Liz, if you could help out. Coming off the rousing success of the pilot, we assumed the client series would go just as smoothly. We're not quite correct. A major piece of the initial proposal was that workshop participants would receive a free tablet to ensure that they could attend a weekly video conference and also use it to go to telehealth appointments, connect with friends and providers, watch TV, and check email. What we learned was that only clients who had already had a peripheral for accessing the internet were really interested in participating in the workshop. This necessitated a slight postponement of the start date and some additional outreach to clients. Luckily, we still had a solid group of folks who committed to participating and provided a lot of feedback that was both useful and inspiring. This feedback was integrated into our proposal for another year of funding, which was submitted in the fall of 2021. I'm happy to say that our proposal was funded again and we'll be back in session with our clients this week. Key adaptations we made included moving clients groups to a drop-in model rather than a closed one, with a focus on a given theme for two weeks, with one session having an activity and the following one uh, of opportunities for discussion of the activity in ways that have been integrated in the client's day-to-day lives. Also begin leading staff wellness retreats because that was one of the requests after the first year was that people enjoyed it so much and they're hearing a lot about it from their clients that they also wanted to have a more regular series for share. Another adaptation we made was designing quarterly in-person and virtual half-day staff retreats. And the final adaptation we made was inviting local share facilitators to participate in in-person uh, Shanti client support groups, which had returned following availability of vaccines for COVID and other treatments. Decide we need to pivot to kind of a mobile share, kind of like that mobile home van that I shared with Hawaii. We needed to meet groups where they were, especially as things were opening up more in person. And we have been going in, into multiple groups, either in person, by virtual, and also uh, Spanish speaking groups with the lead translator or lead facilitator of that group. And the great thing about SHARE is a lot of it is nonverbal. And so it crosses and transcends universal language of either music or arts or different ways of storytelling. I'll leave you with this piece of feedback from one of the program participants. I appreciate the silliness and laughter. To me, allowing space to get weird or goofy for a minute is very healing. Thank you.
This is Xavier de Frepeles, better known as Fantastic Negrito. We brought him to UCSF to meet Charles Lim, a neuroscientist who studies musical creativity. The Duffler's up next. To understand how Fantastic Negrito's brain works when he's making music, Dr. Lim had him play one of his songs while going through the fMRI. So how did his brain respond? The areas that process sensory and motor skills, along with sounds, lit up. You can see them here, in red and yellow. Makes sense, right? But here's the really interesting part. Lim asked him to improvise, to see what happens when he's creating something totally original. Now watch what happens to his brain. The areas that were active before, the ones that deal with motor skills and sounds, are even more active. But see how there's way more blue in the front of his brain? That's the prefrontal cortex, and it's associated with effortful planning and conscious self-monitoring. And it's blue because it's less active. We see that the prefrontal cortex appears to be really shutting down in these moments of high creativity, kind of like letting go of these conscious self-censoring or self-monitoring areas that normally are, are there to help control our output. And Lim says it's about more than just letting go. You view, view it from the perspective of survival. If human beings only could do memorized rote responses, we'd be long gone. And it's not just the thing that happens in clubs and in jazz, jazz bars. It's actually maybe the most fundamental form of what it means to be human, to come up with a new idea. Hi everyone, my name is Tammy Kramer and I'm happy to be here today to discuss um, mostly the expressive arts aspect of SHARE. I was one of the originators of SHARE along with my colleagues and it has been um, a real pleasure to get to develop and um, deliver these sessions. What I bring to SHARE is creative play, mindfulness and spirituality and group facilitation. My roles include teaching artist and lead facilitator. Um, when I first got involved with SHARE, I was at the Osher Center for Integrative Health at UCSF as a communication specialist, and I'm now doing communications around sexual health also at UCSF, and I'm producing and hosting this podcast, Coming Together for Sexual Health. On the top on the right here, you see a picture of me with my cousins taken by my beloved um, grandmother who has since passed and was an inspiration, continues to be an inspiration for me around both creative expression and psychology. And on the bottom right, you'll see me in a teaching artist role with students um, from a class of mine. On the left here, um, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago. I was a Fulbright fellow um, where I collected, recorded and produced birth stories, mostly from mothers and midwives. And this was from a presentation to the Association of Midwives in Trinidad and Tobago. And on the right, I'm with the production team of the 2009 Vagina Monologues at UC Berkeley with Eve Ensler, the writer of the Vagina Monologues. Uh, it was a very critical experience for me to explore how expressive arts and um, uh, social justice could be integrated. Here, um, you'll see an image on the right of me and Selena, and you can see Eric and Liz along with Shanti staff, um, creating puppets at a puppet building workshop I led. And on the left, you see Sir Frogalot, one of my favorite puppets I've built. Um, so here's some more of these kinds of expressive arts activities we did. We mentioned puppets um, and then uh, some mindful movement. So I would say that was um, captured a bit in the closed eye period. Of course, we would do it a little bit longer and more in depth. Um, guided meditation playful movement games. And I really draw a lot from Theater of the Oppressed um, by Augusta Boal. So just want to note that lineage. So this is a video from um, our presentation at the International Congress on Integrative Medicine and Health. Taking the other participants in the room, maybe make eye contact, you can smile, or if you feel so, you can frown. Now let's take it up a few notches to a seven with care. <laughs> So I asked folks after doing about five to 10 minutes of movement, what they experienced. And here are some words that they shared. 
warmth, connection, vulnerable, vulnerable, energized, energized, and a trust, oh, creative, energy, fun, smiles, yeah, spontaneous. Here is an example of a creative story that we put together. This was with clients of Shanti Project, um, where I source, I asked the group to think of some images. I pulled images from um, Google Images in real time. So trying to match what I found online to what people were imagining. And then together we added words and created a story. Um, and it led to this funny cartoon type of deal. Also had these um, playlists created through Spotify that were shared with clients and that we as facilitators would add to. So there's this repository of music that people are welcome to take advantage of when they want to you know, connect with us outside of the time of the session. So that there's some continuity. Selena put together this awesome share toolkit that we've gotten so much great feedback about from both clients and um, from staff. Um, I, I noticed for clients, it, it felt I could see their gratitude and a sense of kind of like affirmation and visibility in them um, that they were able to receive something like this. Um, so on the top left, there's a notebook. There's my favorite item, which is one of the pens, the light up pen. I'm a nighttime journaler, so um, it's been a game changer for me. <laughs> Highly recommend it if you're a nighttime journaler as well. Um, there's some markers, a little finger trap to play with. Um, on, then on the right, there's headphones and there are some sensory toys. So there's something based on acupuncture where you can move it uh, kind of like a ring you move up and down your finger. Um, these little plastic um, containers intended to add something that could, you know, elicit a nice response. So something calming like lavender leaves or perhaps coffee grinds that folks could pull out and have a way to connect with their um, physical experience as, as a way to de-stress. On the bottom right, there is a whiteboard and on the left, there is a thermometer, which um, was used as part of biofeedback demonstrations. And you'll be hearing later in this presentation from Chris Gilbert about um, biofeedback. In, in our sessions, we had folks hold on to the thermometer and watch as their temperature went up and down based on their state of mind as a way to learn about how they can um, understand or connect with their own body's signals. So here's some more participant feedback. The kit itself made me value my creative self again after frontline cancer treatment. Gave me a jolt that yeah, good things are still available. So thank you so much. Um, it's been great speaking with you and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Hello, this is Chris Gilbert. I'm part of the SHARE crew. I've been with them since about three years ago when we started. I'm a psychologist. Um, I worked at UCSF for several years doing bad feedback primarily. Before that, I was at Kaiser Permanente, full-time psychologist in the chronic pain department. And I learned a lot about chronic pain and suffering and ways that a person can regulate their emotions better. That's what it amounts to. A long background in working with panic attacks and acute anxiety with psychosomatic disorders, where this, the body seems to be out of sync with reality, so to speak. It is their reactions are fight or flight, yet the situation is not that dire. Um, most of my publications have been about breathing, so I seem to be really devoted to the topic, and I've been using bad feedback for like over 40 years. So it's really handy to be able to monitor the body and to show the person whose body it is what's happening as they focus on different emotional memories and ways to control themselves. I'll start off with a few slides showing breathing patterns. It's easier to see a line on the screen than to have me put it into words. And I'll give you a sample of what I like to talk to the share groups about, among other things, is regulating the breathing in case they can take advantage of it. What you see here is actually a record of the CO2 coming out of the nostrils. And the line rises as the person exhales, goes down as the person inhales. It's one of several ways to monitor a person's breathing. And they can either see the display screen or I can watch it and tell them what's happening. And this is a perfectly normal breathing pattern. 
which is between 14 and 16 breaths per minute, a little faster than is optimal. But still, the height of each breath is about equal to the next breath. And it goes out easily with a little taper up at the end. Nothing wrong with this. If people breathe this way all the time, ex except when they're running or fighting or shouting, their life would be a lot better. There, by contrast, is same kind of record. The person was somewhat over anxious. They referred to me for breathing problems and panic attacks and hyperventilation and so forth. It looks very different. You can see the each breath is kind of ragged. They they reverse a breath and go back to inhale and exhale at odd moments. But they'd already learned to regulate the breathing with my guidance. It's about this point I said, please slow down your breathing. You know how to do this. Breathe out slowly. Take your time. This is not an emergency. You're not facing a combat situation. You don't have to run away. So the breathing quickly became more normal. And this has advantages to the brain, to the body, all kinds of things. I said, okay, stop controlling your breathing. Go back to where we were before. And see, it's faster again. The person feels more comfortable breathing much more rapidly than physiology would demand. Record the same kind of thing, except the person's background breathing was pretty good. It may look like it's fast, but it's just over a longer time. So the breathing rate is within normal limits. And here I asked the person to think of something really stressful, and it didn't take much to disrupt the breathing. It becomes irregular, faster, incomplete exhale, incomplete inhale. And I asked the person to go back to your normal breathing. And since we had talked about this and developed some techniques, went back to normal breathing. Pretty easy, but this doesn't come easily to people who are referred for panic attacks and anxiety problems. This is just a, a glance of experiment done um, long ago about the differences in breathing pattern related to experiences of anger, tenderness, erotic love, fear, joy and laughter, sadness and crying. Well, good of the details, we just don't have the time, but it's it's something that we all have um, built into us, a certain emotion fully experienced brings on a certain pattern of breathing, which is pretty much the same from person to person. So our breathing is always affecting our emotional state. Emotional states are always reflected in breathing. The reason seems to be that we're getting ready for some kind of physical encounter, such as fighting, running away, exertion, or something that makes you terrified. All these things might involve the body being involved and what happens next, and which is built into us. Here is the record of the actual heartbeat rising and falling between 60 and maybe 80, 85. And you may not realize how much the heart is sensitive to the phase of your breathing. When you breathe in, it goes up, breathe out, it goes down. The same person feeling stressed. Since the breathing is irregular, the heartbeat is irregular too. And this can have consequences over time. The variable is called heart rate variability. The top is good, bottom is bad. And you can learn to go from the bottom pattern to the top pattern using feedback or just observing yourself, getting better and better at controlling your breathing. Here's the autodynamic associations to inhale versus exhale. When you inhale, there's a slight bias toward the sympathetic nervous system in case you're breathing in because you're getting ready to shout or to hit somebody or to run for your life. Exhalation is primarily parasympathetic. So you have a nice, easy exchange between these two patterns and you feel better. If it's an easy alternation, it's supposed to be that way. Here's a breathing pattern now with a chest band around the, around the body to show rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. I just call this just right because it goes down to the point of rest where you're not breathing out, you're not breathing in. The lung is in balance with the air pressure. Here's even better. Notice a slight taper at the end, slight taper at the end, breathing out and then it slows down. This is even better. When a person is practicing breathing for calming purposes, this is an extra little wrinkle in all the situations. 
Now, for the rest of what I have to say to you, there's not any reason to keep watching my face. I'd much rather have you close your eyes and listen to my voice and switch the attention you'd give to visual processing to processing what's going on in your body, because that's where the action is. If you're driving, well, don't follow my directions. Don't try to drive with one eye, pull over, or listen at some other time. It really requires for best effects that you close your eyes and bring your attention inside. Um, fast, fast breathing, irregular breathing, breath holding, or breathing in the chest and the abdomen, and breathing through the mouth rather than the nose. Those are all associated with stress, even momentary stress, even mild stress. You're less likely to breathe smoothly and slowly through the nose with a slow, steady exhale. We're just built that way in case at any moment you have to run for your life or fight for your life and so forth. Um, anxiety, threat, conflict, being close to crying, good preparation for any kind of muscle exertion. This is going to affect the breathing. So conversely, if you change your breathing, even if it's consciously, this will change your emotional state. May not erase it completely, it's back to bliss, but it's a good start. I'd like you, with your eyes closed now, think back to a really pleasant experience you had. Could be yesterday, could be five years ago. Something that pops into mind is, oh, that's when I was feeling really nice, really calm, not excited, just peaceful and calm, at rest, enjoying life. Could be something like lying on the beach, listening to the syrup. Could be lying down at home, listening to music, watching a sunset. Whatever pops into your head, and start to run that little movie in your head and try to re-experience it. Think back to how nice it felt. And as you do that, maybe notice how your breathing changes. What happens? How do you breathe when you're in that state of mind? Because it's a state of emotion, too. Chances are your breathing becomes calmer, steadier, smoother. And if you're breathing through your nose instead of your mouth, that's a plus. It's even better, physiologically better and emotionally better to breathe in and out through the nose. If you're all clogged up, of course, that interferes with nose breathing. Now, think about the connection between that smooth, slow breathing and the very pleasant emotion that you felt focusing on that scene and try reversing it. But here's a funny thing I'll ask you to do. Think of something really stressful, something just the opposite of pleasant. Maybe an argument you had or something you were annoyed at, you tried to return something to a store and they wouldn't take it, or you're driving and a chair falls off the back of a pickup truck and you have to veer to miss the chair. Someone's hassling you. It's something like that. And notice how your breathing changes. Keep your mind on that frustration or anger or fear, anxiety. If you can focus totally on it, you'll feel your breathing starting to become congruent with that emotion. It's very hard to continue to breathe calmly, but still be upset about something because the brain is just not built that way. It wants to help you take action in case you have to. Now, if you go back to the peaceful scene, but continue breathing faster, more agitated, just on purpose now, maybe twice as fast through the mouth, irregular, breathe as if you're really angry, but try to focus on that peaceful scene. And notice how difficult it is. You try to feel peaceful and relaxed, but the breathing contradicts it, denies it. These things are incongruent. The incongruency does not last long. If you tell yourself when you're in a situation that's safe, but you're internally agitated for some reason, you have to tell yourself things like, I don't have to fight right now. I don't have to run. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to run away. I don't have to shout. I'm physically safe but my thoughts and my feelings are activating my breathing. At that moment, when you've used your adult consciousness to decide 
the situation does not warrant getting ready for running or fighting. This is turning off your alarm. We all have that alarm system. And it's very sensitive to what you think is going to happen next. If you slow down your breathing to be in line with reality, your judgment of, I don't have to get ready for anything. Then you breathe slowly, more peacefully, slow exhale. It's like turning off an alarm in your house. Since it's your house, you're opening the door, you put in a key to turn off the alarm. You have that right as the owner of the house, as the owner of your body. You have the right to tell it to stop acting up. There are phone apps you can easily get. Most of them are free, put on your phone, and they pace your breathing. That is, they give you some kind of graphic that gets larger and smaller, or a line goes up, or a line goes down. And you can set this for any number of breaths you like. You can have a longer exhale than inhale, which is a good idea. You could have a pause at the end of the breath. These breathing apps are really good for practicing this kind of breath control. One is called paced breathing. Another is called breathe to relax with a number two instead of TWO. There's also heart math systems for much more money, but they help you to coordinate your breathing in a manner that keeps the heart very cyclical, very steady, up and down, up and down. So that's a sample of what I talked to the people about. And it's my turn to address the groups, the share groups. And they go home and I all practice some of these things and have some insights. Um, that's about it. So I'll end this now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>